could not tell from the in the introduction video, uh, we are going to be talking about some difficult topics. I knew that it was in a case from our children's hospital, <clears throat> and it also uh, it is going to be difficult for some people to hear. Um, it poses a different kind of impossible choice from the one in Sophie's choice, but I think both uh, kinds of impossible choice are uh, helpful for us to think about. Um, not because they're, I mean, this is really an exceptional type of thing. I mean, um, but you all know these are everyday things. Uh, and some of you literally every day. So um, I think it's really important that we think about these topics. So the patient has a five-month-old, I should also say for those of you who may know this child, I changed details to protect the identity and also to simplify some of the uh, story. Uh, this is a five-month-old boy. He was admitted to our uh, NICU, uh, just two stories up from here, uh, with spinal muscular atrophy type zero. <clears throat> so spinal muscular atrophy is a group of genetic conditions that involve the nerves that connect the spinal cord to the muscles, the spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and type zero is the most severe form. Uh, symptoms start for this type of SMA, they start in utero uh, and they're manifest by decreased movement. So, uh, I don't have experience. And the typical one is expectancy for so um relevant to this case uh recent advances in the treatment of sma type 1 have transformed the management of sma there's a uh um, medication called nusinersen it is injected by needle into the spinal fluid that's how it's administered and um the first year of treatment costs about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for one patient um, the second medication, which not even I with my MD is going to attempt to say, um, is a gene therapy. It's administered by IV. It only needs to be administered once. It modifies the genetics of the, um, the, the blood cells, but um, its list price is over uh, $2 million for a single dose. <clears throat> So this patient has a particular, particularly severe form of SMA type zero. Uh, so this is the most severe form. And within that category, he has the most severe variety. Um, he uh, has no ability to move uh, any of his body except for the muscles of his eyes. So he is completely paralyzed. He has received nusinersen off label. Um, it is approved for um, SMA type zero, he doesn't have type or type one. He doesn't have type one, he has type zero. But there were two case reports of trying this medication with children with type zero, and they showed some improvement. Those children in the cases had less severe forms of type zero. So no one, at least th that we can tell in the literature has ever administered this medication to a child with this severe form of SMA. And the medication, the first dose did not bring about improvement in his situation. <clears throat> he has developed blackening of his fingers and toes. Um, this indicates basically the inability to deliver oxygen to distal parts of his body. Um, this is not really a known um, uh, a problem with this condition, but he probably is just so sick that he's not even able to get oxygen throughout his body. <clears throat> Um, according to the documentation, I say it that way because we uh, often in situations like this, there are sort of stories that come to be told and understood within the people taking care of a child, which sometimes are surprisingly not true. I'm not saying this is true or not true, but um, it's always good just to maintain some amount of sort of uncertainty about what we're told. <clears throat> um, so according to this documentation, Indiana CPS has been involved. Uh, due to intrauterine drug exposure, and the father is reported to be wanted for arrest. <clears throat> Conversations with parents have at times been heated between the team and uh, the parents, and some members of the team reported that they feared violence um, if they went against any of the wishes of the parents. <clears throat> um, calls to parents' cell phones are rarely answered. And the family has now, at the time we were called, not been in touch with the team for more than two weeks. 
Um, the so because of this lack of uh, contact with the let's see yeah, um, but even though they have not been in touch with the team, the parents had consistently before that expressed uh, desire for everything to be done for their child to uh, sustain life, and. Um, the, re, the understanding of the team is that the parents are still the legal decision makers, so they have not had their rights to make decisions removed. But there's confusion and uncertainty about whether <clears throat> decisions like things like DNR remain in their hands, uh, given that the baby is technically a ward of the state in Indiana. So there's this sort of complexity that for those of you who work in pediatrics, you see this a lot where um, there's sort of like legal issues going on and they kind of change over time and we don't really know um, what the status is. Uh, the bedside caregivers uh, consistently say that they believe the baby is suffering both because the baby's not able to move and is sort of like uh, subject to actions around them and is not able to really interact with the world, um, but also because they perceive that the baby is uh, exposed to painful, um, you know, interventions. Um, the patient's guardian ad litem has unsuccessfully attempted to get a court hearing in order to guide decision making and identify a proper decision maker, but um, those attempts to just get in front of a court have been unsuccessful. So because of this, the baby effectively has no decision maker. Um, the parents are not in contact. We're not able to get in front of a court. There's a baby unable to move laying in a crib in the NICU with nobody making decisions in his interests. Um, the team feels helpless when they called a uh, watching a baby suffer with no one making decisions. And questions frequently arise about whether escalation slash withdrawal of treatment is possible in this extremely difficult situation because no one's making decisions about whether escalation or withdrawal would be um, in the child's best interests. Okay, that's that's the case. Um, so we're going to come back at the end. And I'll tell you the, sort of the outcome. So we were we were consulted when this baby was five months old, and um, there there was no fixing the problem. Right, the um, team had a baby that they were taking care of who they viewed as suffering, but there's no way to end the child's suffering. Um, and so we uh, talked about it. We sort of did debriefings. We uh, explored the options. We actually were all together on a Zoom call waiting for a judge to join, and it never happened. Um, so two months later, we were reconsulted. The family had uh, been had had conversations with the team very infrequently, had continued to want everything. And uh, we were being reconsulted because the baby was starting to show signs that he was going to die soon and they didn't know how to handle that. The family had told them to do everything. So um, I came into this uh, quiet part of the NICU where they had moved this baby. Um, and there was this very courageous nurse who had her phone hooked up to a speaker that she had brought from home and she played music for him all day long. And uh, she, every time she was on, she was his nurse and they showed love and attention to this boy who couldn't move for months, uh, despite the fact that his parents were never there and no one was making any decisions for him. So we talked through what were to happen if you were to code, um, would doing um, resuscitation be obligatory? And we talked about what would be the medical purpose of that and what, what are the legal boundaries. And so the team talked amongst themselves and they decided that if you were to code, it would not be medically indicated to do resuscitation on him. So uh, that weekend he died peacefully. 